$9,999. The date alone is enough to fill the hearts of the old Sega faithful with bittersweet reverence. If you were lucky enough to have a Dreamcast back then, then I hope this brings back some memories. But as hard as it is for me to believe, those memories took place almost 20 years ago. The Dreamcast is as old now as the Atari 2600 was then. There have been many generations of gamers now who never played any Sega console, let alone the last one. And even if you were gaming back then, if you skipped the Dreamcast in favor of something else, you might look at this little white box and wonder what all the fuss is about. How can a console that lived, thrived, fell and died in a mere 510 days, way back at what we can now accurately call the turn of the century, still stir up as complicated an emotion as bittersweet reverence? Why does the Dreamcast still matter? I was there. And by the end of this, I'll hopefully be able to answer that question for you. But please keep this in mind. A whole lot of my perspective here is viewed through the lens of who I was at the time. A freshly minted teenager living in the US who had just spent his entire childhood as a Sega fan. I mean, I was never an elitist. I'd play anything I could get my hands on. But I was always rooting for Sega. They were like my home team. However, like most 13-year-olds, I didn't even know the definition of the word nuance. With that disclaimer out of the way, here's the part of the story you probably know. The Sega Genesis, against all odds, helped Sega not just compete with Nintendo, but actually surpass them and become the top hardware manufacturer in the industry for a short time. But just as quickly as the rise came the fall, as Sega oversaturated the market with way too much gimmicky hardware, and then abandoned it before it could even get off the ground. It was insane, like let's see how many ridiculous variations on the Genesis we can have at once. Let's make an expensive CD add-on, and then fill it up with god-awful FMV games. Oh, you paid 180 bucks for 32X? Congratulations, it was pretty much dead a year later. Even the Saturn, Sega's flagship 32-bit system, struggled to make it even three years in the US. Every move the company made backfired. Every opportunity they had was squandered. By the late 90s, Sega's reputation among gamers and within the industry was a laughing stock at best. No, really, before Christmas one year, my mom called a store to reserve a Sega Saturn for me, and the guy who answered the phone laughed at her and told her there's no way a kid would want a Saturn. Surely he must have been asking for a PlayStation instead, right? Yeah. That's how bad it was. Anecdotes aside, I think the harsh facts of Sega's downfall are widely understood even today, and they should be. Nobody wants to make those same mistakes. Just look at how long Nintendo kept pushing out Wii U games, even after it became obvious it was never going to get off the ground. But here's the thing. Just saying that Sega pushed out too much hardware and made a few bad moves ignores why that was the company's strategy in the first place. And this is the other side of the story that I feel gets overlooked these days. Sega's short-sighted practices hurt their reputation, sure. But the very same approach was what had made them a household name in the first place. I mean, this was the company that gave away what would have been their most lucrative game with every Genesis sold, just to build as much of a lead as possible on the Super Nintendo. This is the company that, surprise, launched the Saturn months ahead of schedule at the very first E3. This is the company that invested insane resources into making technological leaps years or even decades before those hurdles could or should have been leapt. Anyone remember the Kinect? Well, Sega had a full-body motion controller in 1993. Nowadays, we've got Xbox Game Pass or PlayStation Now, but in 1994, Sega was pioneering a games-on-demand service. These days, we've got the Nintendo Switch, but in 1995, Sega had a handheld console hybrid of its own, a fully-featured portable Genesis that you could also hook up to a TV. Sometimes these ideas worked, most of the time they didn't, but it didn't seem to matter whether it was profitable. What mattered is that the company was always on the cutting edge, ruthlessly, albeit blindly, driving the industry forward. A couple of risky gambles paid off big time and made Sega the king of gaming, only for a string of bad hands to bring them right back down. Sega's whole approach to the market was to throw everything at the wall and see what stuck. That attitude wasn't smart, safe, or sustainable, but it's what brought them to the dance. Now to be clear, the corporate culture did change a lot in the mid-90s. Sega of America, in particular, lost a ton of autonomy leading into the Saturn years. But to see the company emerge from all of that still alive, still kicking, and hungrier than ever to reclaim their crown, to the point that they'd stake everything on one last dream was electrifying. Sega bet everything on the Dreamcast. Sega Tassanchiro died for the Dreamcast. And what rose from the ashes was a more mature, savvier company that finally had their head on straight from a business perspective, 
but with that old attitude still intact, the Dreamcast was a powerhouse with all the trimmings and then some. It was the bleeding edge, and make no mistake, this was the dance. If you want an example of just how crazy Brave Sega was at the time, there is none better than the Dreamcast's bestseller, Sonic Adventure. I know, that probably sounds ridiculous to a lot of you. I can take off the nostalgia goggles and see how certain aspects of it, especially these cutscenes, come across nowadays. That's nothing new, by the way. People thought it was outdated just a few years after it came out. But on September 9th, 1999, I didn't care that it wasn't the most polished game in the world. I didn't even notice, because there had never been anything quite like this before. And it's weird to say, but I don't think there could have been. No real Sonic game had come out on the Saturn, and with hindsight there was a good reason for that. A high-speed 3D platformer like this demands expansive stages that just wouldn't have been possible on previous-gen hardware. In that way, Sonic was the perfect franchise to showcase the Dreamcast. And the visual design of Sonic Adventure is tremendous. True to the series' strengths, every area has its own style and ambience, enhanced by a custom lighting engine tailored for the Dreamcast hardware, and helped along through what I still consider to be the best, most boundless collection of music, and a franchise known for it. And you know, that's an appropriate word, boundless. Because that's exactly how Sonic Adventure felt at the time. I could spend hours just lost in this game, swapping between the six playable characters who all had their own unique gameplay styles, wandering through the open-world adventure fields, bouncing from zones to chow gardens to minigames to zones, just completely mesmerized by the sheer scope of it all. The fact that certain elements of it age so poorly and so quickly is the price of its ambition. Sonic Adventure was a game worthy of its title, and among its contemporaries, it was extraordinary. But hey, I did a whole episode on this one a few years back, so let's talk about something I couldn't show you back then. This was the one feature that Sega really bet the farm on. The Dreamcast was the first console that came standard with a built-in modem for online gaming. So not only was Sonic Adventure the long-awaited rejuvenation of a character that had introduced me to gaming, it was also a trailblazer that gave me a glimpse of what the industry would become. Online leaderboards, community events, just page after page of extra content. The game even had DLC. Console games had always been static before this, so to be able to download a file and see something new in Station Square just blew my mind so hard! And it's hard to imagine how mind-blowing it was, because stuff like this is such an ubiquitous part of gaming now, but Sega was doing this stuff ages before anyone else. Eight years before I was trading Pokemon online, I was trading Chow in Sonic Adventure. But there was something conspicuously missing from this game, and in fact none of the launch games had it. We had a modem, so where was the online multiplayer? Well, for that we'd have to wait a little while longer. The year 2000 saw the launch of what may be the cultiest of Sonic Team's cult classics, a landmark moment in the industry, and the first online game that I ever played. I know, it seemed crazy even then that with all the power of the Dreamcast packed, I spent the entire summer of 2000 playing this simple little 2D puzzle game. The single player modes were a lot of fun too, but competing against people online was what kept me coming back. Future Rocket on the surface might seem like such an easy little game. You just place arrows to direct mice into your rocket, and direct cats into everyone else's. But here's the kicker, every player can only place three arrows at a time, so every round is spent frantically countering your opponent's moves, which constantly undoes the moves you just made, and all this alongside the torrent of roulette events means there's never a dull moment. But okay, okay, as much of a blast as that might have been, let's get to the Dreamcast's actual signature online game. I will never forget the first time I ever loaded up a game and saw this. Other, real people who had made their own avatar just like I had, conversing with each other, cracking jokes and sharing tips, and just moving around in real time. It was one of those few watershed moments where I knew that the way I looked at gaming would never be the same. This was the first MMO ever developed for a console. This was Fantasy Star Online. The MMOs that would eventually dominate the genre had this weird hands-off approach to combat that's like kryptonite to me. But Fantasy Star Online was direct. Press a button, swing a saber. Time it right, do a combo. Just the sound effects and animation of whacking a monster, or of taking a hit, god, it's like you feel this stuff. So it's an online hack and slash RPG with simple but crunchy combat, and while there was plenty of depth to it if you wanted to go there, PSO's strength was in just how easy it was to pick up and play. And to this day, my friends and I still get into it every couple of years. God, I miss the old Sonic team. Hi, Digi. And PSO is a showcase for why they used to be one of the top-tier developers in the world. Each of its four stages were completely distinct in terms of enemies, set pieces, and visual design. Every stage had its own dynamic soundtrack, 
and every stage was capped with a boss battle that does justice to the word epic. Now admittedly, to actually level up enough to get through all this requires so much grinding, it'd be an untenable chore if you were doing it all by yourself. So what made it worth it was the community, and that made it completely different from anything else I had ever played. I remember how overwhelming it was the first time I got to the final boss, saw this idyllic field transform into a hellscape, saw all the chaos surrounding us. But I wasn't alone. I had found a regular crew, people who had taught me how to play, helped me the whole way through, and gotten me here. And through all of that, through dozens of hours of hanging out in the lobbies, through hundreds of runs fighting this dragon over and over and over again, I had found real friends in a video game. I remember a Ramar by the name of Spidey, and man, if you're still out there, thank you for everything. These are just a few of the games that defined the Dreamcast for me, but this video could potentially carry on like this for hours on end, because Sega just would not let up. They didn't play it safe with the Dreamcast. They didn't push out a bunch of samey sequels to establish franchises. No, the bulk of Sega's output was built on brand new IPs attached to some really imaginative ideas. Crazy Taxi! I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. A game about getting people from point A to point B as fast as possible by any means necessary. It's such a classic video game. A real-world concept taken to the extreme, where silly concerns like traffic safety and realism are thrown out the window in the service of fun. Crazy Taxi and its sequel execute on that concept perfectly, and I still play them all the time. Seaman is like a madman's Tanagachi with an M rating. Its commitment to meticulously depicting a natural life cycle, along with its surreal aesthetic, makes it the most unnerving virtual pet I've ever seen. I thought I had a bunch of weird little fish babies, and then they started drinking each other. Yes, right. As if. Oh yeah, and it comes with a microphone so it can talk to you. All that uncanny valley stuff becomes strangely endearing and even philosophical, as Seaman gets to know you. But if you like your chills with a few more thrills, how about taking down the undead? Not with some boring weapon like an axe or a gun. Let's do it with the most dangerous weapon of all, a keyboard. Typing of the Dead is absurd and campy and wonderful, and I mean, just, just look at this! They've got Dreamcast strapped to their backs, and it's just played straight! Like, of course, yeah, how else would we handle this? I could go on and on! The Dreamcast library was packed full of inventive titles that were like nothing else on the market. An eccentric rhythm game with retro future jive, a pioneering 3D fighting game with simple but super-powered combat, a smooth platformer where you play as this bizarre robot boy with magnets in his head. Oh, and who could forget the creative artistry of, uh... Uh, no, that's just football. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but Sega always seemed to take genres that I didn't normally enjoy and create games that just gelled with me. I never played sports sims before or after, but on the Dreamcast, I could play NFL 2K1 online and cream for meatheads I'd never even met. Oh, or what about Virtua Tennis? Yeah, tennis game, I'd be skeptical too. And everyone I've ever shown it to started out as a skeptic. And yet I've played this game with friends deep into the night so many times. And you know, I really don't play many story-focused RPGs. You know, the kind that care more about immersion and world-building than skillful gameplay. And despite that, oh, do I ever love Shinmu. More than anything else on the Dreamcast, it's hard to wrap your mind around what an achievement Shinmu was in its time. Graphics technology came a long way in the 90s. In one generational leap, the way that games depicted realistic humans went from blocky polygons wagging their heads to something that looked recognizably like people. For the first time, polygonal humans could show emotion. But alright, I can't really show you footage like this. This is the best part! Leave me alone! I hit the jackpot! And claim that Shinmu wasn't at least a little strange. Even when it was brand new, it came across as odd and uncanny. The game was helmed by a native Japanese speaker, directing English voice actors, and the script had an excessively literal translation. Yeah, that sounds familiar. But I don't know. With Shinmu, I can't imagine it being any other way. It's like one of those poorly dubbed monster movies, and this campiness is so core to the appeal. Way more than I've actually played the game, I've joked about, Hey mister! You wanna wrestle? Or the way Fukusan is such a jobber? Or the way that voice actors can't get it straight whether they should be calling this guy Rio or Dio? And the campy dialogue quirks are even more pronounced when nearly the entire first disc is just spent wandering around these unfamiliar areas talking to people. Uh, and that's another thing. As gripping as it is when it gets there, Shinmu does take a long, long time to get going. 
I mean, the most infamous thing about it is one of the very first things you do. I'm looking for a place where sailors hang out. Would you happen to know a place where sailors hang out? Do you know any places where sailors like to hang out around here? Do you know of any places where sailors are likely to hang out? Are those people sailors? Why don't you ask them yourself? And yeah, I love it. It's stupid, but it's hilarious. But here's what the memes miss. Every single person you talk to has something unique to say to you. And that's what was really mind-blowing about Shenmu, and what's still kind of unprecedented about it all these years later. The depth of the detail, just layer after layer of incidental attributes, so subtle that the average player wouldn't even know they're there. NPCs in Shenmu don't just stand in one spot. Every character in this game operates on a schedule, with a home they come from, places they'll go, jobs they'll show up for. Even the people that never make a dent in the plot have names. The weather would change in real time, and yeah, that was graphically impressive, but I mean literally real time. The story takes place in mid-80s Japan, and there's a mode where the weather will match what it was really doing there on a day-by-day -day basis. That doesn't matter, it's not going to affect the game, but it's there. And that's kind of the point. You can collect Sega capsule toys, choose whatever drink you want, feed a kitten, open every cabinet, enter every room, look behind individual picture frames, or do what I did and waste the time away playing classic Sega arcade games. None of this stuff makes a difference. None of it advances the story, but it's there because of what Shinmu was trying to be. The most complete simulation of the real world that the industry had ever seen. Now, it wasn't flawless by any means, but it went to ridiculous lengths to achieve this. Admittedly, all of these accoutrements are more technically impressive than they are conducive to gameplay. The titles that followed in Shinmu's footsteps would define the genre by giving the player agency, not by giving them a curfew. And perhaps that speaks to why, in my mind, Shinmu is the definitive Dreamcast title. It was the most expensive game ever developed at the time and in order to even turn a profit, it would have had to sell more copies than there were Dreamcasts. But as always, Sega was more interested in making a game groundbreaking than making one that was profitable. Those 510 days were some of the best I've had in 24 years of being a gamer. I played so many games that might have been million sellers on another console, led by characters that could have been icons. I experienced instant classics that pushed the boundaries of what gaming could be and redefined what the term meant to me. The Dreamcast deserved to succeed. Sega needed a win. They earned a win. But none of that mattered, because outside of that small pocket of hardcore Sega fans, gamers at large saw the Dreamcast as a risk not worth taking. A monolith was steadily growing over the horizon, and it overshadowed Sega through every single one of those 510 days. It felt like nobody wanted a Dreamcast, because everyone was counting down the days until October 26, 2000. Everyone was waiting for the PlayStation 2. Just three months later, Sega announced the end of Dreamcast production. And no matter how much the price dropped as they tried to liquidate their stock, Sega could hardly even give the system away. Ultimately, the Dreamcast was the worst-selling console Sega ever made. The PS2, in turn, would go on to become the best-selling game system of all time. Let me temper what I'm about to say with this. The PlayStation 2 became a great console, with such a stellar library that by 2005, even I had to get one. But five years before that, when I was in middle school, and just about everyone I talked to dismissed the Dreamcast because apparently the graphics sucked, and when I had to hear over and over again that this was going to be the true start of the next generation, well... I could not stand this overpriced, overhyped, ugly little black box. I mean, look at it with its two controller ports. Now, you know what? That's appropriate, because two was about how many exclusives it had that were actually worth playing. Heck, you know, all the reasons people hate the Saturn also applied to the PS2. It was a nightmare to develop for. It was twice as expensive. Sony had shipping difficulties and couldn't even keep them in stock. And the few that were on the market kept failing. But no, it doesn't matter because it only sucks when Sega does it. All bow down to the mighty Emotion Engine. The PS2 didn't even look like a game console. Like Sony thought you'd be ashamed. Oh no, what if people see it and think that you play video games? And yet, this overblown DVD player was somehow worth ignoring the Dreamcast? <sighs> but the truth is, and I never would have admitted this when I was 13, but the Dreamcast's failure was Sega's own fault. Sega's awful reputation preceded any move they could have made. 
Developers were wary, consumers didn't trust the brand, and so the system's fate was decided before it even launched. I mean, everyone knew what was gonna happen. Common sense said it wouldn't be worth spending your hard-earned money on a console that was just gonna be abandoned a year or two later. So it was figured, and so it was. And really, everything was about to change, and I was changing too. On May 25th, 2001, the very last thing I did before I turned 13 was something I'd done a lot as a kid. I beat Sonic 1, and I did it on the Dreamcast. Yeah, there was this compilation of classic games called the Sega Smash Pack. Uh, the emulator they used for it left a lot to be desired, but it was okay. It just seemed like the right way to go out. The reason I bring it up is because it had a surprisingly heartfelt introduction in the manual, and that was probably the first time I ever felt bittersweet reverence. Reading this reminded me of everything I loved about this wonderful hobby that I had spent so much of my childhood on, and I think that's when it hit me that the Dreamcast really had failed, and that because of that failure, because the market had so strongly rejected it, all of this was just kinda gonna fade away and be a memory. We were losing Sega, and things would never be the same. Of course, Sega didn't die. They're still around today as a third-party developer, and a lot's changed, but they're doing alright. But the Sega that I grew up loving, the Sega that fought tooth and nail to define their name in the industry, only to blindly drive that name into the ground, the Sega that made me a gamer, that introduced me to this hobby, that became my obsession, that has become my career, that Sega did fade away. And in the wake of that, so much changed in such a short time. Through the PS2's success, gaming finally became legitimized in the mainstream. For the first time, being a gamer didn't necessarily make you an enthusiast. The whole perception of hardcore gaming was redefined. And that's good, that needed to happen, and I'm glad we are where we are. But maybe part of the reason the Dreamcast is so revered is because it was this glorious, wonderful, dying breath of an era when gamers were guaranteed to be geeks. But you know, that's not such a bad way to be remembered. Nothing could have saved the Dreamcast, but it did matter, and its reputation as an underappreciated trailblazer has become its legacy. The proof of that was apparent back at the start of the episode. I could take it as given that even if you never played a Dreamcast, you still know it was something special. And the reason for that is because people like me have never shut up about it, we've never let it die. Homebrew games are still being developed for it. There are all kinds of fan-developed hardware mods and video converters that can help edge it closer to modern standards. And most notably, that dedicated fan base is the reason I've been able to show you the system's online functions. The official servers shut down 15 years ago, but SegaNet lives again thanks to a fan-made project called DreamPie. There's finally an easy way to hook that old dial-up modem to Wi-Fi, and the community has spent years now getting a huge chunk of the system's library back online and playable again. There are only a few hundred of us now, but I'd love to see those numbers surge, and I'll be happy to play with any of you guys anytime. It'll be easy. The Dreamcast has had a permanent spot under every TV I've owned for almost 20 years, and I don't think that could ever change. After all that time, I can easily say that this is my favorite game console. The Dreamcast burned fast, but it burned so bright that its fans have never let the dream die. It's still thinking. But hey, isn't there one more game you'd really think that me of all people would have said something about? After all, it was the last time Sega's mascot ever appeared on Sega hardware, but that game would become the introduction to the series for a whole new generation by being one of the best-selling games on a Nintendo console. It was the end of one era and the start of a new one. Next season on The Geek Critique, I'll look at Sonic Adventure 2 and the games that followed it as I chart the course that led Sega's most famous franchise to rock bottom. Thank you to Benjamin Woodring for sponsoring this episode, and I hope it was worth the long wait. Thanks to all of you for watching, and until next time, you keep geeking, I'll keep... Crutty can.